Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be about make a hit in the animation in Clip Studio Paint presented by Molly Hedy Carroll. Before we begin the webinar, there are some housekeeping items that we'd like to go through. This webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. There will be a Q&A on the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Please uh, use the question panel uh, to send all your comments, questions, doubts. Also, due to the constraints, uh, not all the questions will be answered. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be shared on social media and also on our YouTube channel. The panelists for this webinar are Mario Quinones, myself, and Molly Hedy Carroll. For those of you who connect with us for the very first time or never heard about Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is your all-in-one solution for stunning, ready-to-publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. Learn more at clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com. Also, if you tag us with hashtag webinar at Molly Hedy Carroll at Graphicsly at Wacom and at Clip Studio Official, we'll be sharing your stories. Irish born Molly Hedy Carroll is a 2D artist and animator based in the Netherlands who specializes in all things creatures. Always obsessed with studying animals, especially reptiles, she now makes, makes up her own as a creature consultant in the games and animation industry. In 2013, Molly co-founded Arcane Circus, the game studio behind Crap and Broke, and the Kaiju-based pan-media IP, Sunny Beast, whose uh, recently released animated short, Kaiju Cutie, uh, just blew up on YouTube. Molly freelances for clients such as Netflix, Universal Pictures, Night School Studio, BBC, Impact, Gameworks. Uh, Crash, uh, Crackshell Games and Aniki Studios. She also gives lectures about creative creature design at conference, conferences all over the world and teaches at the Utrecht University of the Art. So without much information, I will leave you with Molly and her amazing presentation, Make a Hint in the Animation with Clip Studio Paint. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mario. So, hello everybody. Welcome to Make a Hit Indie Animation in Clip Studio Paint. Uh, my name is Molly Hedy Carroll, and in a former life, I wanted to be a herpetologist, which is a person who studies reptiles. Uh, but now I'm an artist for the games and animation industry, and I specialize in all things creatures. Um, animation takes up a lot of my time, but my background is actually in video games. Um, I co-founded the game studio Arcane Circus with my partner, Eric Conveys, who is unfortunately no longer with us. The big project at Arcane Circus currently is a personal IP called Xenobeasts. And uh, Xenobeasts are giant monsters who destroy a 90 Saturday morning cartoon city. Uh, Xenobeasts was originally conceived to be a card game. Uh, but has now grown into a multimedia project. Some of the things you can enjoy now for ex include um, a, a series of one-shot comics called uh, Xenobius Profiles, which is on Webtoon, and also uh, a cartoon Kaiju Cutie, which was entire animated in its entirety in Clip Studio Paint, and it's what I'm here to talk about today. Now, um, hopefully you have all watched Kaiju QT preferably several times, but if you haven't seen it, then please, after the presentation, head over to Arcane Circus's YouTube channel where you can watch the short. Um, also in this presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the box and my lovely host Mario will ask them at the end. And if there isn't time to answer your questions, you are more than welcome to contact me uh, via my social media links, which I will uh, I have in a slide at the end of this presentation. So uh, in order to make Xenobis Kaiju Cutie, I used Clip Studio Paint, specifically Clip Studio Paint EX. Uh, the way that I landed on Clip Studio was actually through my sister, Faye Hedy, who recommended it to me. 
Fei Hebi works as an animator in Tokyo and brought the software to my attention because a lot of the anime studios that she works at use Clip Studio. Uh, incidentally, Faye is also working on her own animated series, which is called Kimono and Chibi-chan, which you can see here. And I highly recommend following her on Instagram at Future Cartoons Tokyo to check out her show. So it's something I really love about Clip Studio Paint is that it, ha it supports hand-drawn animation, um, the pipeline for hand-drawn animation very well, and also has a lot of really good drawing tools. It means that I can practically make my entire cartoon in one software, which gives me as a solo creator a lot of flexibility. Um, and in this presentation, I want to cover uh, each of the steps of production pipeline for making an indie animated pilot. And I want, you, by the end of this, for you to feel enabled to make your own cartoon. So firstly, in very, very broad strokes, uh, these are the three steps of a production pipeline for an animated short. The pre-production, figuring out what it is that you're going to make. The production, actually making the thing. And the post-production, once you have all the pieces that uh, bringing them all together and putting it out into the world. Now, this may seem simple, but these, each of these steps has its own little mini steps as, as well. And don't worry if this seems a little bit overwhelming. We're going to go into each and every one of these steps with some fun anecdotes about Kaiju Cutie's production along the way and specific ways that Clip Studio Paint can help you in creating your own indie cartoon. So let's get right into it then, starting with pre-production. Step one, story. Story is where it all begins. Now, I want to keep this presentation fairly, fairly um, superficial so that you can get a general overview of how to make a cartoon. Story could be a 10 hour plus presentation on its own. It is a huge, it is a huge topic. Um, but one thing I do want to share regarding story is that if you are going to make an indie animated uh, pilot, um, define at the beginning how many stories have to be supported by the world that you are inventing. So is your cartoon a one-off? It's a single short with a closed ending and the only things that exist in that world are within that one short. Is it a mini series where it's a collection of smaller stories that tell one big story and then has a conclusion at the end? Or is it uh, a bunch of self-contained stories set in the same story world that technically would, would hypothetically go on uh, forever? In my case with Xenobis, I went with the latter. And if you are considering creating an indie pilot for your own personal IP, like I have done, I would highly recommend approaching your storytelling in this way. Um, this way of approaching storytelling, um, I have coined infinite storytelling. And I came across, uh, I came upon this term infinite storytelling when I was analyzing uh, superhero comics. I'm a, I'm a big comic nerd. And I realized that superhero media is genius because the way that the story world is set up is there's infinite ways that a criminal can crop up and a superhero can take them down. And I think this is the reason why things like Batman and Spider-Man and Superman um, have survived for decades and will never run out of stories to tell because they have this formula for creating infinite storytelling. Um, in Xenobeasts, the way that I've approached this to hypothetically tell infinite stories is that each of the Xenobeasts, currently there are four, um, have different personalities that clash with one another. Uh, but by learning from each other's perspective and way of going about life, they, they learn and they grow and they're able to live in harmony. Uh, I believe everyone in the world has room to learn from other people's perspective. So with this approach, I think that I'm able to tell infinite stories with my creations. So once you know what your story is, you're able to design characters to support that story. And I'm a pers personally a very, very big fan of character-driven media. And another person who's a big fan of character-driven media is Charles Zimbillas, um, who is my mentor. And while he was mentoring me and teaching me character design, he heavily, heavily encouraged me uh, to create personal IP and to make it character-based because it gives your audience something to really latch onto. 
Uh, Charleston Villas, for those who don't know, are, is the original designer of Crash Bandicoot and Spire of the Dragon. He also worked on the original 1980s He-Man and She-Ra, so if anybody knows a thing about characters, it is him. I would highly urge you to check out Charles and Billis. He goes at Ats and Billis on Twitter, and he also has a website, theanimationacademy.com. So with my characters, with Mashabuni and Hagara, the stars of Kaiji Cutie, I wanted to create um, two characters that are the embodiment of machismo and the embodiment of childishness. So my approach to character design is I have a, I have a design problem in this case, the design problem, a creature, a giant monster that represents machismo and a giant monster that represents childishness. Uh, then I come up with as many creative solutions to that design problem as possible. The more out of left field, the better, because then it's more original. These are some of the initial sketches that I did for the Xenobeasts back in 2017 when I started developing it. So then I follow the ideas that seem the best fit for purpose and to fulfill the story needs. Uh, these are some of the sketches for early sketches for Mashabuni. And you can kind of see if you go from left to right, how we kind of slowly but surely ended up with uh, Mashabuni's final design. Uh, Charles Mbillas was mentoring me at the time when I was developing Xenobeasts, and he also contributed uh, these beautiful sketches to Mashabuni's design. These drawings are also uh, by Charles and Billis of Hagara. And here's some of the slightly more refined drawings with Hagara when I was really starting to figure out who she was and how she should be. So once your design is settled, you need to make production art so that your team know how to draw the character consistently. In my case, I was creating the cartoon, uh, I was animating on my own, but nevertheless, I still created production artwork to refer to when I was animating. The reason for this, even if you're on your own, is you do not want to be guessing or trying to figure out the way that the character looks or expresses themselves while, while you're animating. You'll have enough on your mind as it is when you're animating, and you, so you want to be thinking as little as possible about anything other than executing in that particular part of uh, part of the process. So these are so for production art. Um, there's several pieces of production art that one can make. Here, illustrated now, is a turn sheet, which is solving how the character looks from different angles and still reads as the character and is as appealing as possible. You also have emotion sheets, which solve the issue of how the character expresses themselves, because nobody expresses themselves the same way. Uh, you also have key poses, and key poses define the attitude and the energy that the character should give off when they are acting and performing in your cartoon. And here's the same production artwork for Hagara as well, the turn sheet, the emotion sheet. Notice how Hagara does not emote the same way as Mashibuni because she has a completely different personality. And the same goes for the key poses and the way that she expresses herself and acts. Next up, I'd like to talk about VizDev. Uh, VizDev is short for visual development, and it is a part of the pre-production where you figure out the vibe of the project that you're working on and whether or not they're the key story moments that you have in mind work as and have the right emotional impact that you're trying to look for. It's a pretty powerful tool, VizDev. Um, for my cartoon, I want Xenobeasts to give off the vibe of American TV animation from the 90s and 2000s, so like Powerpuff Girls and uh, Johnny Bravo and shows like that. So uh, when I was designing the characters and coming up with the world, uh, with this in mind, I created a couple of pieces of VizDev artwork. Uh, these pe specific pieces of VizDev that I'm showing here were done under the guidance of Barry E. Jackson, who is a visual development and uh, storyboard artist from Hollywood. He also worked uh, for Ralph Bakshi on productions like uh, Cool World. I highly recommend checking out Barry's social media, barry.e.jackson on Instagram. All right, so so we know our story, we know how our story is supposed to look. Now we get to get to a very fun part, which is storyboarding. So your storyboard animatic is kind of like a minimum viable product for the entire film from beginning to end. 
uh, it determines the cuts and the shots and the timing. And uh, personally, I spend a very, very long time on my storyboarding stage. I redo it and redraw it and play and practice until it is giving the intended reaction that I want and all the creative problems are solved. Then I pretty much lock that in and I don't move very far away from it. Like with the video that you just saw, my storyboard and my final are kind of all, like not one-to-one, -one, but very, very close. Now, some people, they don't approach it this way, but I do. Um, some people write a script and they write down what every shot should be. But personally, uh, drawing is my language. And it's also, drawing is also kind of the way that I think. I th like, I think by drawing. So um, when I'm storyboarding, I know, I know what the beginning, middle, and end is, and I know what the moral of the story is, but often that's it. And then I'm sketching it out and trying to figure out it out from there. Um, that uh, This approach to storyboarding is uh, inspired by the way that Miyazaki approaches his films and his storyboards. Um, he, his stories come to him as he is illustrating them and as he is boarding them. And I feel like this is kind of like how my brain works as well, and it works for me. But um, it's a preference thing and everybody's brain works in a different way. Some people prefer to start with a script. Uh, other people prefer to have a lot of room to deviate from the storyboard. But personally, I stick very close to mine. So we're done with the pre-production, right? Oh, what's that doing there? Music? What? Already? Normally music is later, sometimes even the last thing that's done. So why is this in my pre-production? Well, here's the thing. Uh, Kaiju Cutie was inspired by dialogue-free slapstick cartoons like Tom and Jerry. And these cartoons are driven by their musical score. The music is very important. What happens musically coincides with what's happening on screen. So like if Jerry's coming out of the hole, the music will go dun, 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 and then Tom will try to hit him with a hammer. Dun, dun, and then he avoids it. And then he runs away. The music is like really leading the action in these types of cartoons. So I brought in my musician, Michiel Nyhoff, right when the first storyboard was finished and he started creating a musical score at that point. I didn't start animating until there was more or less a musical structure in place because the way that the animation is timed has to be timed to the music. Um, then the musical score was tweaked throughout production and the animation was also tweaked to coincide with the music. So for example, after the first iteration of the storyboard was done, here's an early draft of the shot that Michiel scored. Very, very musical driven. I highly recommend checking out Michiel Nyhoff, who goes by Sample Master on Twitter. Okay, now we're done with the pre production. Hooray! Good job, me. But now we have to actually make the thing. Oh, Lord, here we go. Starting with the rough animation. So, um, starting with my time storyboard, which is visible here, I make my, I start animating, um, and I know how many frames I have to get from one pose to the next because I, I lock in my storyboard and it's the music drives what happens on screen. So then I end up with something like this. Um, when my focus when I'm rough animating is making sure that everything fits within the timing that I've established in my storyboard and also drawing as uh, expressively as I can and coinciding the action with the music. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Xenobeast's art style is very influenced by American TV animation, but not only in the way it looks, but also the way that it's animated, particularly uh, 90s and 2000s Cartoon Network um, that applied limited animation, where as few drawings as possible are used in order to uh, in order to convey um, motion on, on the screen. So these are things like Powerpuff Girls, uh, Dexter's Lab, Two Stupid Dogs, Samurai Jack, and Johnny Bravo. Johnny Bravo in particular was a very big influence. So I have a gif here of a shot from the opening of Johnny Bravo, and uh, I've slowed it down a little bit. 
So there's quite complicated motions here where he's swinging his arms around and running and stuff like that. But there's like one, two, one, two, and then he lifts up three. There's about three drawings actually, not including the head turn and the mouth moving. And then um, it's going, it's reliant, the animation is relying instead on snappy movements and smears into really beautiful key poses. So those particular drawings are doing a lot of the heavy lifting and conveying the appeal and uh, the information to the audience. So you can see here, for example, I'm applying a similar technique where there's this drawing, then there's a smear as he comes down, and then there's this big expressive drawing of Mashabuni flexing. And here it is again at more normal, slightly more normal speed. Another influence of mine is uh, the Paul Rudish Mickey Mouse shorts. I really, really love the way that this cartoon will just have these complete off model breaks where they're purposely drawing something that doesn't look like the character and doesn't fit the production art with very extreme faces and uh, really unexpected things that really add to the humor. Um, Paul Rudish actually worked on or created Two Stupid Dogs and he was heavily involved in Powerpuff Girls and Samurai Jack so there's no it's no surprise that things that he works on tend to appeal to me. And another really big influence on the way that I approach animation is Cartoon David. He just maximizes the pose and expressions and minimizes the amount of animation. Like there's shots in this like here, he doesn't even smear, it just pops into the next, into the next pose. And the genius thing about Cartoon David is that it wouldn't be funnier and it wouldn't be better if the animation had more frames or the animation was higher fidelity. It's just the perfect amount of, of, um, of simplicity in order to convey the information and make it really, really funny. And he is an absolute genius in this regard. Now, some of his cartoons are mature rated, but if you're okay with that, I really, really recommend checking out Cartoon David's YouTube channel. It's a real masterclass in uh, limited animation, and he is a very, very big influence on me and the way that I approach animation. So speaking of uh, bringing it back to Kaiju Cutie, um, I have a survival tip from, for you. So funny story, picture this. This was a situation that I was in during the production of Kaiju Cutie. You are on an airplane, you have a tablet, and you are animating, working away on your rough animation, when suddenly your stylus breaks. Absolute disaster. What are you gonna do for the next couple of hours? And you're gonna fall behind in your production. Well, fear not, I figured out a solution to this. So through some experimentation, a little bit of science and a lot of desperation, I discovered that with a tampon and a little bit of tin foil from your packed lunch, this works as a makeshift stylus and I have proof. See, it works. So fun story, this shot from Kaiju Cutie was animated partially with a tampon. If anyone has contact with the Guinness Book of World Records, I would like to hear, I would love to, to talk to them because I imagine that this is maybe a first in animation. So anyway, I needed to share this story when we're talking more of animation. Let's move on now to uh, back to business and move on to cleanup animation. So for your cleanup animation, you're taking what was established in your roughs and then you're finishing. At this point, all the thinking should already be done. You should just be focusing on doing. If during, your, your, uh, if during this phase you find yourself thinking a lot, there's a pretty good chance that you haven't established enough information during your storyboarding phase or your uh, rough animation phase. You should not be thinking only doing at this point because you got enough on your mind trying to make your drawings as clean and as clear and as uh, appealing as possible. So during my, uh, during my cleanup animation phase, I opted for the pencil tool, which is visible on the left in, of uh, this slide in Clip Studio. And uh, the reason I went for the pencil tool rather than like an ink tool or a, or, a, uh, or a line tool is because my animation is already fairly limited. 
So I liked that there would be a little bit of variety in the line and a little bit of movement in the line um, when big shapes are being held. I would never reuse a drawing. I would always redraw everything to give it just a little bit of life. And um, the thing that inspired this approach to animation for me was 1960s Disney animated movies, uh, like 101 Dalmatians, which you can see here. Um, so in in uh, pre-digital animation, uh, animation utilized cells, which were clear pieces of plastic where the drawings would be put onto the cells and then they would put that under a camera and they'd photograph every frame. Uh, Pre-1960, Disney used an inking process where the animation would be put, uh, the cell would be put over the drawing and a department uh, would go over with a brush and draw and clean up every individual frame. But then in the 1960s with productions like 101 Dalmatians, um, they used a Xeroxing process, so they so they took the animation and they essentially photocopied it directly onto the cell, which gave this kind of roughness to the line, which is something that I always really liked when I was watching Disney movies uh, as a child on VHS tapes. And since it's my cartoon, I can do whatever I like. Uh, for comparison, uh, these are inked lines uh, from 1950 Cinderella. And here they are next to each other. You can see the difference in the line quality. The funny thing is that at the time, a lot of people really didn't like the way that the Xerox line looked, including Walt Disney himself. He didn't, he's on record saying he didn't like that you could see the animator's line and he was worried that it kind of broke the illusion that you were looking at living, breathing characters. Though he didn't like the inking enough to keep the inking department because um, Xeroxing was much cheaper. So he opted for, for Xerox and fired the entire inking department. So he didn't like it, but kind of liked saving money a bit better. But anyway, uh, mistreatment of animators aside, uh, I really, really like the look of Xerox animation. And uh, I like that you can see the hand of the artist in that style. Um, I did all of the animation, rough and clean up myself, with the exception of this one drawing which was done by Jeanette Chudragar, who's a quite famous director and animator uh, here in the Netherlands. Jeanette created and uh, directed, sorry, excuse me, directed and animated Dutch adult animated series, Hideous Hank. He's also a writer and animator on Ultimate Recap cartoons. The chronically online of you will know this show. It's like, like with dancing toothless and stuff like that. He works on that show. So um, I'm friends with him and I contacted him because I had this pose where Mashibuni goes crazy and I was pushing it as hard, far as I could, but I had this feeling that his style would push it even further. So I contacted him and asked him if he was interested in plussing this drawing. And 10 minutes later, he sent me this in 10 minutes. I don't know if he immediately saw my message and then started drawing in nine, and it took him nine minutes, or maybe he saw my message nine minutes after I sent it and drew this in one minute. I don't know, but this is a this is a real testament to what a what a good artist Jeanette is. So after he sent this, my, after my initial wow, this is so good, I asked him if he had the PNG because I was worried I'd ruin the line quality. And he went, No, I've already deleted it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I ended up making from the from the drawover that he gave me. Uh, please follow Jeanette. Uh, he's on Instagram as Jeanette underscore in a in a imagination. He's a genius. Next up, backgrounds. Very often in animation production, the anim the backgrounds are done um, separate from the animation, and then it's flattened and brought behind it either um, in the in a video editing software like Premiere or something like that. But uh, in my case, my backgrounds were done in the same Clip Studio file as the animation, with layers and everything. And um, the reason I did this was, um, was to benefit from the Clip Studio environment in two very key ways. The first is that it allowed me to do parallax scrolling. I'll explain what that is in just one moment. And um, I also, it also means I was able to create backgrounds that facilitate the motion. So first, let me just talk about what parallax scrolling is. Uh, here's the opening shot from Kaiju Cutie. And notice how the background in the far background moves at a different rate to the foreground. 
So this is a little bit easier to see um, if you remove layers. So I'll just take away layer by layer. So this is called parallax scrolling, where you move the things in the background slower than the things in the foreground. It's a trick I, I learned from video games, and it's a very simple and quite quite cheap, like time-wise and effort-wise way of adding a sense of depth to uh, to a scene. So. This one is probably the easiest to see. You can really see the difference in rates of movement there. The, the sky isn't even moving at all. And the background moves the slowest. And then one more time for comparison, here's everything all together. So parallax scrolling is something that is much easier to do in the Clip Studio environment versus taking it elsewhere. Um, something else that me is a reason why I'm able to do this is because I'm kind of like my animation and background department in one, because I did both the animation and the backgrounds in the cartoon. Um, but as, as both departments in one, having the backgrounds in the same file as the animation, it means that I'm able to tweak my backgrounds to facilitate the motion going on and that it doesn't interfere with anything. So, for example, this shot, this frame, to this frame with the arm going up, um, I can tweak everything in the background and then hit play in Clip Studio and immediately see if there's any visual confusion, if there's any tangents, like um, that's where two lines of objects that are not uh, that are not uh, that are not connected touching, so it can create visual confusion. Um, I can also keep an eye out for other visual issues and immediately on the fly be tweaking until everything is super clear and nice and clean like this. Next up, color. I did my coloring after I'd finished all of my uh, all of my cleanup animation, and before I started coloring anything, I made this. Um, I colored a, I colored and lit one frame from every shot in the cartoon. There's around forty shots in the cartoon, and this is what's known in the industry as a color script. So a color script is partially to define the color palette and the lighting for each shot and make sure that the different like the different scenes are visually distinct from one another. But another thing that a color script is doing is um, it allows you to visually support the emotional arc of the story. So using Kaiju Cutie as a case study with this, um, I wanted the colors in the different parts of the story to reflect Mashibuni's mood. So at the beginning, he's happily destroying the city and there's lots of pinks and blues. Then Hagara comes along and starts to irritate him. And as he's being irritated, uh, yellows are introduced. And then once he completely loses his cool, the cartoon palette, the cartoon's palette goes from yellow to red. And then he has his tantrum and, uh, and it subsides and the entire palette becomes more gray. And then at the very end, Normalcy is restored and it's back to the pink and blue. These are the key beats in the story. And then this is the overall, uh, the overall uh, color script for the entire short. Now, color scripts are good um, and they're helpful. But there's an, actually another method that's used a lot less in the industry that I actually think is superior, which is color barcodes. This is where you take every shot and you squish it into a couple of pixels and then you line them up next to each other. And then you're able to see if your palette and your, if you can see your story in the palettes changing in this barcode. And sure enough, in this particular one, you can see at the beginning, you have the intro, then you have the blues and the pinks, then you have little spacks of orange and little spacks of yellow as these sort of like anger moments pop up. Then at the end, there's this, this gradient from yellow to red, and then there's a sudden cutoff where it's gray, and then there's a little pop right at the end to finish it off of the blue and the pink, and then we have the black of the credits. Once the coloring is established, we get to my favorite part, yeah, which is the coloring. I absolutely love coloring cartoons. And I have a tip for a really great plugin if you color your cartoons in Clip Studio. 
it's uh, this one, the Close and Fill tool by K96, which is available for free on the Clip Studio Assets Store. There's also um, a paid version that you can get with Clippy, but the free version is the one that I used, and it's an absolute game changer for uh, coloring, to be honest. So what this does is it allows you to make a selection with your drawing, and it automatically makes um, a color layer without any edges, and you can go in, you can select other areas, and it will color it. This saves heck of a lot of time. Now it's not perfect. There's little quirks to it that you get to know um, if you if you're using it. But uh, for me, this was really, really useful for doing my flats, the initial coloring of each object. Just select and boop. Now I have my flats. Then I'd switch to the one tool with refer to all layers and apply to connected pixels only. Then I would um, select my areas, I'd expand it slightly and then bucket fill and makes coloring super super quick absolute game changer and really speeds things up so we go from coloring my favorite stage to shading my least favorite stage i absolutely hate shading and the reason i hate shading is it feels like it should be as much fun and as easy as coloring but it's not it's really hard <laughs> and there's no shortcuts so shading is like it's like an animation process all its own it has to be consistent and it has to be clean and the shading lines can't be boiling around or it really makes your animation look very amateurish so it's very time consuming and you can't rush it do not underestimate how long good shading takes depending how complex the shot is it can take as long as animating the rest of the shot but having said that the results speak for themselves. It really adds a lot of volume to the figures and a lot of visual fidelity. So as much as I hate shading, it is worth all that effort. We're almost there. Final step, the sound. So like I said, the uh, Design of Beast Kaiju QD is very music driven and there was effort made to not um, have too many sound effects and let things be driven by the music. But um, sound effects are still a very, very important part and we're still very key to, um, uh, to, make, to making an impression with Kaiju QD. And I was very lucky to work with Ben Reichstein, who brought the short to a whole new level with the sounds that he created, especially for the short. Uh, ben is a Foley artist, which means that he generates a lot of the sound effects that he creates for productions himself. Um, so, uh, one of the most important things for Kaiju QD for me was it was the first time the Xenobis were going to roar. And a Kaiju's roar is like very, very important. I mean, Godzilla's roar is iconic. So, I, uh, I really wanted to make sure that the Xenobis sounds were handled very well. And Ben did and uh, just went above and beyond with this. So, um, as an example, um, with Mashabuni, the direction that I gave him is I wanted Mashabuni to sound like massive metal creaking and groaning like a cruise ship because he's just, because he's powerful and he lives in the he lives in the sea. And um, this is this is an example of one of the roars that Ben created with all the other sound effects taken away. And how did you do this? This is what goes into making Mashibuni roar. How? I guess Ben just must be a, ma a magician. I highly recommend checking out Ben's social media. Uh, he's on Twitter as Ben Reistein. He also has a podcast called Field and Foley where he talks to industry sound designers about their experiences in the industry and creating uh, sound effects. If Foley uh, sound is something that interests you. So, oh my goodness, the production is done. We've made the thing, hooray. Well, almost, we still have the post-production. Oh, it feels like you're done and then you're not, but post-production is super, super important. First step of post-production, you have all your pieces, now you got to put it together in the compositing, uh, in the compositing phase. So normally there would be a lot of tweaking and backing and forthing in a video editing program over multiple departments, but I did all my compositing in Clip Studio. Um, 
uh, and also my uh, actions were tied to my storyboard. So all the music and the sound just automatically uh, lined up. I even did all my camera work in Clip Studio. So this is a very, very complicated shot here with a lot going on. And it looks something like this in Clip Studio. Every single element is on its own layer here. It's a very complicated shot. You have the background. Um, you have the parallax scrolling at the far background. You have the little people running and they're all different types of people running at different speeds. You have Hagara. You have the car that she steps on at one point. And I was able to just create all of this in, uh, in Clip Studio, time it to my storyboard. And then it was just a matter of um, exporting every clip for all 40 shots. Um, putting it on a timeline in an external uh, video editing program, uh, adding my sound and my music by Michiel and Ben, and then I'm finished. I, I did this before there was uh, audio scrubbing in Clip Studio, which has been added recently. So, so now it might theoretically not even, you might theoretically not even need a video editing program. For your compositing stage, I have a little tip, which is that uh, Screen Shake is your friend. I learned this from video games. Again, as a very, I'm all about cheap and easy ways to add it, punch and impact to your to your work. Um, shaking the screen emphasizes the action in a way that doesn't require a huge amount of effort. Um, this is utilized a lot in video games, and it's funny because it feels so cheap but it really, really works. And it feels like, oh, am I going, am I using, like, is it a crutch? Am I kind of um, using it too much? No, like you can get away with so much more screen shake and add so much to your cartoon. It's fact, it's better to go too far with it and then have to pull back. You can't have enough. More screen shake, the more screen shake, the better. So let's move on to the next step now, which is the thumbnail. So if my analytics are anything to go by, most of your viewers are going to see your thumbnail and that's what's going to convince them to click on your cartoon. The thumbnail is the first impression. It's really, really, really important. And in my case, my thumbnail was also my title card and it was also a promotional image to, uh, for the cartoon. Uh, this title card thing was once again inspired by theatrical cartoons like Tom and Jerry, which have a title card. It's a holdover from when they were playing in cinemas. And I was very lucky that my title card was done by Klaus Schrinski, who is a AAA storyboard artist who used to work in the comic book industry. Uh, these are some covers that he created for comics. Uh, when he was creating my title card, he approached it kind of like a comic book cover, where it's one single image that sells the story. Now, think about this for one moment, for all you comic book nerds watching now. How many comics have you bought because the cover was really cool and it invoked a really interesting story in a single image? The same goes for your YouTube thumbnail. This is why it's so important. I highly recommend checking out Klaus's social media. He goes by Storyboard Klaus on Instagram. And after all of that, all there's left to do is to put it out in the big wide world and let everybody see. And I did this on January 13th, 2024 with Kaiju Cutie and the rest is history. And with that, your cartoon is finished. Hooray! When I released Kaiju Cutie, I politely asked people to watch it and let me know what they think. And day one, it got like 200 views, which I was delighted with. And then it just it just took off. Um, it's it's um, currently sitting at around 148,000 views as I'm recording this video. And the positive reception has been incredible. Um, my favorite re responses to Kaiju Cutie have been people telling me that they're having a really difficult time and it made them smile and brightened up their week. And I made Kaiju Cutie during a very dark time in my life. And it's wonderful to hear that something made in such a hard time for myself is able to bring happiness to other people. It's just great. And a huge, huge highlight for me working on this cartoon is uh, fan art that I've received, of which I'd like to highlight a little bit of now. Uh, here's a couple of pieces uh, uh, in Cartoons World on Instagram, Starboy AY2 on Twitter, 
and Curious Bubbly Beetle on Instagram. Highly recommend checking those guys out. And if they're watching, your fan art means the world to me. Thank you so much. And in broad strokes, these are the steps for creating your very own cartoon. Um, I hope that this takes some of the mystery out of the process and you feel equipped to make your own cartoon because the world needs your cartoons. If you feel if you have some, a story you want to tell and characters you want to show to the world, please do it. Go go and make it. I want to see your cartoon. Before we go, I just want to show a little sneak peek of the next Xenobish short, which is in the works. It's currently in the storyboarding phase. Here's a shot from it. If you can guess which Xenobeast it's about, I'd love to hear your theories. So thank you so much for listening. Please go watch Xenobeast Kaiji Cutie. Uh, please subscribe to Arcane Circus for the next cartoon. And also that card game that Xenobeast was initially uh, supposed to be is something that I do actually want to release one day. I have big plans for my big monsters and you can contact me at these various websites and social media platforms. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Molly, for this amazing presentation. We really I loved it. Um, we asked at the beginning from which part of the world were you watching us? So we want to say thanks to Tamara from Chile, Chris USA, Robson Ireland, Sarah, hey. who join us always from Iran, Marcus Austria, Texas Adriel, Rose US, Merlin, Belgium, Germany, Fenja, Sarah, oh. Austria, uh, Poland, Magdalena, Gran Canaria, Marta, India, Devna, if somebody said it was also from the Netherlands, I, I cannot find it so many. Oh, <laughs> so cool, well. oh, my goodness. The whole world came yes. to see my short, my, my presentation. That's awesome. Definitely, we loved it. And unfortunately, our, our time is limited, so we'll try to share the most popular questions, which are Allah. Uh, so, um, one general question, so how, how long did it take you from pre-production, production, post-production post -production, to finish your short film? Um, in total, it took me two years with uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, gaps in between. Like I said, it was made in a very dark period, so there were a lot of periods where I couldn't work on the cartoon. Um, the follow-up I'm hoping to have finished um, uh, within this year, um, and also I did it uh, almost entirely on my own with the exception of the music, the sound design, that one key pose and the title card. So that's also a thing that made it take quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's go with some technical questions. Um, does the final compositing stage happen in Clip Studio 2 or does it happen in a separate or an external software? My final compositing I did in Premiere. Um, which is kind of like using a, a nuclear bomb to kill an ant, because that program is able to do a lot of things. Um, it, I, uh, after finishing Kaiju QD, the, um, the audio scrubbing tool in Clip Studio uh, was released. So I haven't, I haven't used it yet, but in theory now you could do your compositing completely and entirely within Clip Studio, but I haven't tried it myself. In my case, I used Premiere, but it was just a matter of exporting every, every shot in, uh, out of the Clip Studio files, popping them on the timeline, sticking the music down, sticking the sounds down, which it was already tied to the storyboard uh, by, by uh, Michiel and Ben, and then it was done. Mm -hmm. And that was actually another question. Uh, which version of the software did you use? I used uh, mostly one, then about halfway to, through two, and now I'm using three. Mm -hmm. Clip Studio Paint X, right? Yes. <laughs> also another question, if you use a, a tablet for um, designing? At the beginning, I used a tablet. Um, two years is a long time, so I switched a lot with software and I experimented a lot. The setup that I'm currently using is a, um, a, a Microsoft Surface, which I, I hook up to a Wacom Cintiq when I'm working from my from my office. And if I'm traveling, which I do quite a bit for my job, um, I draw on my Surface Pro. Mm -hmm. Uh, here are some very interesting questions from Eka Dimas. Um, 
What are some essential steps in the animation process when using Clip Studio Paint? Essential steps. Um, I think um, the the production pipeline that I that I showed, um, understanding why it's broken up in that way. Um, I hope I've made that clear because you there's step when you're actually doing um, when you're doing your cleanup animation and everything like that. You don't want to be thinking. You want to be doing and focused on the doing. So as much as much as you can take out having to switch your thinking in every step, I think that's actually the most essential of all. Um, on top of that, uh, in order to be able to execute well, having good solid uh, animation fundamentals is also very important. And um, part, part of that is studying other animations, part of that is uh, drawing from life and analyzing from life. And part of it is also practice. I mean, yeah, like, uh, Every, everybody should feel enabled to be making things and learning by doing, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, Marta Sanchez says, thank you so much, Molly, and also huge thanks to the organizers. Thank you, Marta. Uh, <laughs> we're going to read your second question, which is very interesting. Uh, how did you handle stress and psychological pressure, if there was any? You are so cool, Molly. Oh, <laughs> that's really nice. Thank you. Oh my goodness! Um, yeah, that's uh, that's that's quite a question to ask. So during uh, during the creation of Xenobis Kaiju Cutie, the co-creator of Xenobis, Eric uh, Convase, and the co-founder of Arkin Circus actually passed away. So I had a lot of stress <laughs> while I was working on this. And um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I'm very stubborn, and um, I try to, and I'm I'm a real firm believer in. Um, in uh, creating no matter what. So my mentor, Charles and Billis, anyone who's ever been taught by him probably knows his catchphrase, which is keep creating. And um, for artists making art, it's like, it's like breathing for me. If I didn't, if I didn't make art, I think I, I think I would just perish. And no matter how difficult things get, as long as I can keep finding the strength to make things, I feel like it'll be okay. And some days I'm able to make progress more than others. And sometimes I need to prioritize resting, but, um, but to, to, to continue to create no matter what, and, and believing in that, like really truly believing that to be true, which I do, um, gave me a lot of strength to keep working on my project during a very difficult period for me. Mm -hmm. um, another question from Aaron Yu, uh, it's regarding about your background, if the short film was part of an academic uh, progress, uh, process, sorry. Oh, uh, no, <laughs> I haven't been in college for about 10 years now. Um, I made, I made this because I, because I wanted to. Now, granted, I have been, um, I have been, uh, I have been making games for with Arcane Circus for uh, since 2013 is technically when it started, but there was a games project that came out in 2016, a mobile game called Crap I'm Broke, and um, Xenobis actually started to be worked on fairly shortly after Crap I'm Broke released, but there was a lot of things happening during that period. I've been cooking it for a very long time, and um, yeah, Kaiju Cutie came about because um, uh, I, I have these big plans for my big monsters and a lot of projects that I want to make. And um, fortunately enough for me, making an animated short is something that I can theoretically do myself. Now, I did have people helping me and I'm very grateful to my team uh, for all the work that they did. They brought the short to a level that I, that I never could. But having said that, it is still fairly unusual that I wrote the story myself, I designed the characters, I did the storyboarding, I managed the team, I did my rough animation, my cleanup animation, my coloring, my shading, my distribution, my marketing, I did everything. And I really like the freedom that that gives me where I'm not beholden to other parties or other people in order to make my projects. And at the time, 
uh, I really, really wanted Xenobeasts to be in the world, and uh, animation was a way for me to be able to do that. Moving forward, I have projects that will require um, uh, partners or help from other people and things like that, but uh, animation is something I can do myself, and there's a lot of strength in being able to make something yourself. Mm -hmm. Another uh, common question from Elijah Minter. Thank you so much for this webinar, Molly. What are some things to keep in mind when creating animated shorts for film festivals? Oh, well, firstly, thank you. That's very nice. Um, second of all, for festivals, um, I think probably the, if, you're, if you're making a short with the intention of getting it into festivals, I would recommend, uh, I would recommend two things. First thing, no dialogue. Don't have any dialogue in your short because that immediately limits your thought to places that speak that language or you have to do subtitles which can be time consuming, it can be expensive. If you make a short from the beginning with no dialogue, your chances of getting into festivals is instantly increased. Um, the second thing I would think about is make it really clear um, what about your short is, um, what's the word, um, remarkable. And I don't mean make it really good, remarkable as in able to make a remark about it. Something about it that's like, that stands out as interesting about it. Um, the story is really, is really charming. The animation technique is very interesting. It's about something really personal. These types of things where it's really clear what is remarkable about your cartoon, I think will also help because these people who run these festivals, they get thousands of submissions and um they need to they need to very very quickly within within a very short amount of time right at the beginning of your short understand what is what is interesting about it so but that's that's also that's also kind of odd, odd advice because it's sort of like make it like oh make it really good i think probably a better I think probably a better, that's still true, but as a person, I think the approach should be make something that you really care about. Don't make something that you think other people will care about. Make something that's really important to you. And that will come across to the people who are seeing your cartoon. And um, getting into festivals is really cool, but um, it's not the only way, like th think, about, think about the reason why you want to get into a festival. If it's to get views, I mean, if I showed my short at a film festival, like maybe a few hundred people would see it, max, maybe a thousand, versus the internet where 148,000 people can see it in two months. Um, so, so that's my advice for getting into film festivals, but do think about the, the reason why getting into festivals is important to you. And um, keep, do keep in mind that that value can be found elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And another question is regarding if you record yourself for acting references, do you find references online or for other um, projects? Oh, there are there are so many cringe pictures of me posing <laughs> that I take with my phone and my phone stand and videos of things. Absolutely, I do it a lot, especially for like weird angles and stuff like the. Um, there's a piece of uh, promotional artwork for Kaiju Cutie and it's Mashabuni holding up a building from a low angle. And I had so much trouble drawing this part from low until I put my phone on the floor, put on the timer, held up a book, and then I saw, oh, that's what's going wrong. Oh, my hand is supposed to be like that. No, absolutely, refer refer to uh, to the real world for your cartoon as, uh, if you're struggling with something. Absolutely, I do that too. <laughs> And well, unfortunately, our time is limited. And before our last question, we will to say thank you. Uh, we have a lot of love shared by people like Alan saying wonderful presentation. I'm in love. Uh, Tiffany said thank you for sharing. Um, amazing here from Mexico. Yay. Uh, Boston, Central Love, also from France. Um, was fascinating. Great job by Merlin. Very good, thank you, thank you so much. Well, a lot of uh, greetings and thank all of you who join us live. Oh, and so, so also, wonderful. If there are <laughs> questions that were not answered, you're more than welcome to get in touch with me via Instagram or via my email on my website. I'm happy to answer any questions that went unanswered today. 
Mm -hmm. And we can watch the, the film on Arcane Circus, right? On YouTube? Yes, Arcane Circus on YouTube. Please watch it and please tell your friends. And please yes. subscribe because the follow-up will come out this year. I want, I'm determined to make that happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and one question that was also very popular is about what would you say to somebody who wants to create his, his or her first uh, short film in Cliff Studio Paint? My advice would be, you don't need anyone's permission. Just, just do it. The world needs your cartoon. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So with those wise words, we mm -hmm. are closing our webinar. Uh, thank you so much, Molly, for ama this amazing presentation. My pleasure. And before we go, uh, we're going to share one last bit of information. And learn more about Eclipse Studio Paint on our website, clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com. Many of you asked, and yes, uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to Eclipse Studio Paint channel and also to Graphicsly. We have done uh, two other webinars about animation, so check our Graphicsly webinars playlist. Uh, they are very interesting and in, for sure they will help you on your projects and for more information as molly said uh, follow her on and subscribe to arcane circus and uh, check um, her website preachercolson.com and sanities.com so with that thank you so much molly for this incredible presentation my pleasure thank all of you who join us live and stay tuned for more webinars promotions and tutorials about Clip Studio Pain. So stay tuned and see you next time. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.